Oh, no, look at me. I haven't even put... Oh, my God, what an absolutely awful start to the week. I didn't even... Put... <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I didn't even put an overlay on the bottom of the channel. <laughs> ah, it's Monday. There's always problems on Monday. Let me get this up here. Menu and Garnacho. <laughs> Good morning. I hope you had a great weekend. It's Monday. Problems. There's always problems on Monday. Uh... What should I do this? Bit of this, bit of that. That's the most embarrassing start I've ever had. By the way, I'm sorry to everyone on Facebook again. I've restarted everything. I've reset everything. I was expecting this to work. It's not worked. For some reason, the Facebook chat is still not working. So I'm apologies to everybody, but can you come across uh, to YouTube if you want to have a chat with me? Wait there. I need to open this up here. What is going on? That's got to be a mistake. That's got to be a mistake. I need to open... Mate, is that Nuruddin? Have you... My God, good morning to everybody and good morning to Nuruddin. I mean, what can you say about this community? I thought it was a quiet weekend. I thought we we're going to come in here, have a nice little quiet start to the show. We're going to speak about Colby Maynew. We're going to speak about Alejandro Garnacho. But, but Nuruddin, man, you've broken, you've broken me straight away. You just gifted 150 memberships. Man, you must have had a cracking weekend. You must have had a scorcher of a weekend. Whatever you did at the weekend, it was nowhere near as good as Nuruddin's. I thought that was the worst start to the show, to the show ever. It's the worst start to the week, but it's actually it's one of the best. Nuruddin, good morning to you. Good morning to the best community that ever existed. In fact, I, I used to say it was the best United community. I think it's just the best community in the world now. Ever. Ever. Good morning, everybody. Nuruddin's more than a captain. How was your weekend? I'm really annoyed about Facebook not working. I don't. I, I for the life of me, I don't know what's going on here. Um, I thought I fixed it over the weekend. I didn't fix it, so I apologise. If you're watching on Facebook, I know you can watch the show, but you have to come over to YouTube if you want to write your comments. I apologise. I don't know what was going on here, uh, but I would say hello to everybody in the member gang. But there's there are so many down here. It's an absolute genuine. It's like a green army. All of you. And I can't actually comment on here. What is going on? The, the fucking chat. It's really annoying when it doesn't work. Anyway, I would say <laughs> I can't. I can't even. I can't speak. That was a. <laughs> that was a really uh, interesting start to the show. Um, Nuruddin, good morning to you. Aunt Carl, Josh, Vicky. We've got Sultan down there. Peter, good morning to you. Ross, you're there as well. John, we've got Nino. We've got um, everybody. Everybody. Good morning to all of you. Uh, and look, I hope you're having a great day. I hope you had a cracking weekend. I actually had a couple of days off. Well, I didn't. I say a couple of days off. I was going to do a video on Saturday morning, but I was. Just, I think you all know how I look at the content on here. Is if there's if there if there's if there's not a talking point that I think is strong enough to bring you to watch a video, then I won't do one. Uh, and that's kind of why I took a, a couple of days without doing a video over the weekend. I hope you really enjoyed the video that we released on Friday, though. I was going to mention this later in the show, but I'll mention, I'll mention it at the start of the show. It was a, a kind of a different... You know these new style videos that we've started here on United People's TV? We've got the Hoyland one, and we've got the Martinez one, the Gary Neville one. And we had this one as well. This is why I love football. It's kind of a different one altogether wasn't really about telling a, a sort of a, a story and a narrative. It was more kind of tapping into the emotional side of being a football fan. The emotional side of um, why we all love United. Why we all um, love this community. Mate, Nuruddin, man, you've completely, completely and utterly shook me there. Completely shook me. Um, anyway, sorry, it's, it's completely made me, made me sort of, <laughs> lose my position but I hope you enjoyed that video um, I really really did 
and and I'm I've said this to you already, but if you go into the Discord, everyone, there's a new channel in there um, called Video Suggestions. So this week, for example, we've got two videos coming out. Hopefully, anyway, one of them is going to be on the Vidic and Van Dyke debate because that's been going around. That's got so much energy behind it, and I don't really understand why. Uh, so that one is going to be coming out hopefully midweek, and then hopefully towards the end of the week, got a really good idea for a May new one that um, I want to be doing. So they're, they're, they're the ideas for two of those videos this week, but you might have other ones. For example, um, it's kind of a tired conversation now, but you could, you could technically um, speak about Skulls and Gerard. Or stuff like that. Maybe some just narratives and stories that you feel could be pulled through into um, like a, a short story. That's what these videos are. Short stories. And I, I'm enjoying doing them. I want to do more of them. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed that one. And we've got some cracking ones coming out this week. Let's go for a roundup. That was a rogue start to a show. As I said, I apologize to everybody on Facebook. I, I, I can't seem to fix it. I don't know why. I have no idea why. Uh, I'll try again after this. Um, it's completely working on YouTube. I know I'm live on, on Facebook. For some reason, the chat's not popping up. It is what it is. But copy menu. Right? <sighs> Gareth Southgate, man. It's got to be one of the most uninspiring managers. Like, fair play to him. Like, he's... He's done well as England manager, right? But when it comes to that, the, the final hurdle, he just can't get England over the line. Whether it's, was it Croatia in the World Cup semi? Um, Italy in Euros final? Like just, I don't know, just like coming up against like elite opposition like that, it just kind of, just kind of comes undone. Um, I'll nerd him. You sent a super chat there. He says, uh, dude, you're saying that it needs to take some time off to focus on priorities. Mate, dude, that is a hell of a sign off. You've been an incredible member of the community and you've invited so many more people into it. And I think that's the best thing about this community. I really, really do. And I've, I've said this all, all along. The fact that membership gifting has become um, like a tradition on here. It's like you're enjoying it so much that you're welcoming other people in. That's what a good community does. So big up to you. I hope you, well, I hope it's nothing bad, but I'll speak to you soon. But Gareth Southgate. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, look, I find it ridiculous. If I'm, if I'm being honest, I'm using the word ridiculous. Like how much energy there has been in the last, last week or so off the back of Jeremy Cross in the Daily fucking Star writing an article saying Gareth Southgate and the England job. And it just got, it's got so many people, even Gary Neville speaking about it on the overlap with Roy Keane. And then Sky Sports have done like a in-depth looking at Gareth Southgate article. It's just like, it's not going to happen. Like it, when it comes to whatever happens with Eric Ten Hag, and I'm going to be speaking about it a little bit later in the show, all right? This is a really important article. came out on Friday from Mike McGrath in The Telegraph about the sort of changing managerial role at Manchester United. And I'll be speaking about that. But Gareth Southgate is not going to follow Eric Ten Hag, all right? Whoever, if, if Eric Ten Hag is not our manager next season, it's going to be... Someone who, in in philosophy or concept, is going to be a similar style of manager. It's not Gareth Southgate, mate. Is <laughs> Gareth Southgate is somebody? It's kind of almost the opposite, and it's just it's tiring. I, I I can't believe that there's been so much energy going into people just getting. This is just it's, it. I don't think it's rage bait, but maybe it is. Because if you say something just so outlandish and just so crazy that people feel implored to get angry and argue against it, and that's just what this Gareth Southgate stuff is. Oh, yeah, he's linked with Ineos. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dan Ashworth is, oh, he's got some sort of relationship with Dave Browsford. Oh, piss off, man. 
Anyway, Gareth Southgate. Ooh. Do you watch your game? I didn't watch the. I didn't watch the full game. Didn't really care. Watched a little bit at the end with uh, Manu, when Manu and Rashford came on. It's just good to see Kobe Manu playing for England. Or is it? Well, it is. I'll be honest. Guy just oozes, man. Absolutely oozes. Um, I really, really wouldn't be surprised uh, to see him on the plane going to the Euros. I suppose that will depend on what happens between now and the end of the season. Um, but I think from a profile perspective, when it comes to building squads, you need different profiles. That's that's what happens. You have different options and different players to use in different situations. And there's not really another midfielder in that England team who does what Connor, Kobe Mainu, Connor, who does who can do what Kobe Mainu does on the ball. Therefore, I think he's not a shoe in to go, but he really should be. I, I, I thought that was a cool picture. Look at that. <laughs> Andreas Pereira, sort of um, kind of the definition of hard work paying off. Was never really the greatest footballer, but he grafted and did he, I think he went on loan to Flamengo, didn't he? Before he ended up going to Fulham, he's become now a mainstay at Fulham, and now he's kind of broken into the Brazilian national team. Fair play to him, man. Uh, Alex, you're saying I think Ornstein's view on the manager situation is spot on. Yeah, we spoke about that uh, last week. I think it was last week, wasn't it? Um, let me see what you're saying about Southgate and Ten Hag down there. Southgate over Ten Hag is another step back. United need to honour the contract. Um, de -de 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 -de. Uh, just putting United's name to a story, says Beastie. Oh, man. It was, um, I, I can't believe that there has been so much energy. And then Gareth Southgate was asked about it in before the press conference. It's just, pff, it's ridiculous. Vicky, you're saying uh, United needs somebody to, to bring in a structure and discipline, which they have with Ten Hag. They want to talk with someone softer than Solskjaer. If Oli had existed, you could probably say this about a lot of United. In fact, pretty much every United manager post Fergie. Had we had a better structure in place, it may have been a different story with Van Hal. It may have been a different story with Mourinho. It may have been a different story with Solskjaer or Radnick. Probably wouldn't have been a different story with David Moyes because it was David Moyes. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool there. Manu and Pereira. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't mind this being the United. <laughs> Jared Branthwaite, you know what I think about Jared Branthwaite. You also know I think there is a possibility that Man United get outpriced for um, Jared Branthwaite. I, d I just don't know whether United are going to sign any player that's going to be in the like 60 to 70 million range this summer. Uh, th I think if we're going to do it with anyone, it will probably be Jared Branthwaite, but it also depends, of course. And then Cole Palmer. Who was a cracking signing by Chelsea, man. And I would not mind him at United either. Anyway, that's a little, that's a little random picture. But as well as, of course, his international rate, there was more than one uh, Man United player playing. And Alejandro Garnacho, I think he played uh, 45 minutes against El Salvador. And if you compare, if you go back and watch the highlights, they're available everywhere. And you, you can actually watch Garnacho's individual highlights. And you compare his performance against El Salvador. I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't like putting up trees. But you talk about the maturity and the development of Alejandro Garnacho, and that's the thing that I've been sort of shouting about the most this year, is he's really, really developing and maturing. Because when you when you come through the youth team and you're a player as good as Alejandro Garnacho, you're big fish in a small pond. Give me the ball, I'll do it all. Right? But when you go in when you go from the youth team into the first team. It's not quite the same. You need to therefore become a team player. You need to mature and develop. That's what he's done this year. And if you compare that performance against El Salvador compared to when he's, any time that he's played for Argentina before, you can see it's different. How he carries himself is different. The decision making is different. What he's thinking about is is just, it's different. It's improved. It's better. And he's really maturing, I suppose, into a man. Um, and and the thing that I've said he's been doing a lot this season at Manchester United, he wasn't doing last season, he's a proper team player now. He's doing that tracking back when necessary. He's getting involved in different positions. He's always available. He's not just focusing on what can I do going forward? Give me the ball. I can make a difference. He's he's just he's a solid team player. And just to have these two lads, it is... um. 
youth is always exciting, man, when it comes to football because they've got their whole careers ahead of them, right? They haven't done it yet. They want to achieve it yet. And then you can match your ambitions as a fan with their ambitions as uh, as youngsters. And the youth will have in pretty much every business in, in any sort of, or in anything really, the youth will be what takes you forward into the next era, into what's coming up. And we've got Mainu, we've got Garnacho, we've got Rasmus Hoyland, who can play, I think it was 83 minutes he played for Denmark. Was it against Switzerland? I don't know. Um, but he was fine. I don't think he's going to be starting the second game. Remember the Danish manager said he spoke to Man United beforehand, said that's not going to happen. Uh, Christian Eriksen completed 90 minutes. Good for him. Good for his legs. Minutes into his legs. Remember, everyone ever, ever seen that little video? <laughs> Minutes into his legs. Anyway, random. Garlic bread man, you're saying, I think the Southgate BS is Ineos using reverse psychology on United fans <laughs> and making the Eric Ten Hag out brigade fall into line. <laughs> it's funny that. Pretty. I mean, I'll tell you what, that's pretty, pretty effective reverse psychology as well. Because if you, if you have, if you gave a million United fans a poll in front of them, of Gareth Southgate next year or Eric Ten Hag to see out his contract, I'd be very surprised if you got any more than 5% saying Gareth Southgate. Very surprised. Extremely surprised. Anyway. Mainly made his debut. Garnacho just really impressed. He's developing. He's continuing to develop. Hoyland played 83 minutes. No injuries. Um... <laughs> That's probably a good idea. I, 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 for some reason, this is not only is the chat not working; it's not actually letting me comment on here. Like it's not like I'm not logged in or something like that. Even though it's my channel and I own it. Uh, okay, it's weird. Uh, so that's I can't put a poll on here. I don't know why. Today is not a good day for the interactivity on here. <laughs> I apologise about that. It's Monday. I think it's just it's just feeling sad. But more good news, right? About this bad boy. Martinez. You know what I said about Martinez during the international break? I personally wasn't particularly happy that he was flying out to USA, joining up with the Argentina national team, and that he... I don't, I don't know. I just felt like he could have done any sort of recovery that he was doing at Carrington. But this is what's been reported here. Uh, Martinez did not travel to LA, so he was... He was out with the um, Argentina national team for the first part of the international break. In the second part, he's flying back to Manchester. He's gone back to Manchester. Completed a week of good training, was seen with an, well with the national team. He returns to continue the last part of his recovery in England. So, Martinez, no issues, right? Martinez completed a week of training with the Argentina national team. He's back at Carrington now. And it's a question of whether he'll be ready for Brentford or whether Manchester United will, I suppose, wait, give him a few more days and then reintroduce him away at Chelsea. And part of that conversation, I think now, will be around this. Um, I think, uh, Ebifemi, you're saying is Martinez back to full fitness? He's not back to full fitness just yet, right? Miles, it is the internet gremlins, aren't they? Are, they are not working with me today. But at least the stream's working. I apologise to everyone on Facebook, but I have no idea what's going on there. I reconnected the accounts, restarted, in and out, did it all, should be working. Wah. Nil point. But Harry Maguire left the England camp after suffering an injury against Brazil. I think it's, as I say there, it's, it's not expected to be serious, but even Harry Maguire. Maguire's... Um, Availability has always been one of his uh, biggest strengths as a player. Always. Can you hear those motorbikes? Anyway, probably can't. Right, let's get back into the show. Got distracted there. Harry Maguire's availability has always been one of his greatest strengths. And even him, even him this season, um, injuries. Don't know. Um, so if Maguire's missing, I think Lindelof is fit. 
I think Varane is fit. And we know that Varane, of course, retired from international football, so Varane should be totally sound. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see. I personally, I'm not rushing Martinez back for anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you did hear the chaps. <laughs> There's a lot of internet gremlins kicking it in today. It's, it's Monday. It's the international, it's the international break. <laughs> ah. I don't think I'd rush Martinez back for Brentford. I'd rather wait. I'd probably start him away at Chelsea, but then, but then, um, if you're going to do that, you're probably not going to be playing Martinez twice in four days away against Chelsea and then at home against Liverpool. So, and you're probably looking at going, well, you might bring Martinez on as a sub against Mart as against uh, Brentford towards the end of the game, then rest him against Chelsea and then have him fully, fully fit for the Liverpool game. But I don't know. And as I said, I think part of whether or not he is brought back is is depending on, on what options we've got available. If we've got Varane and Lindelof against Brentford, would that be enough? I mean, Brentford haven't been very good this year, but we've got all... Let's be honest. Don't remind me about... Um, don't remind me about United playing <laughs> Brentford away under 10 Hag. <laughs> Typical though, isn't it? I think I said last week, I said, look, are we going to have... A uh, fully fit Martinez and Hoyland and uh, Bruno's getting a rest and Martinez might be back. We know it's so, this is what's happened all season. Anytime there's been any good injury news for Manchester United, bad injury news has followed. I think Casemiro's got some sort of... It, there was some... Uh oh, the bikes are coming back. Ah. Uh. Go away. Don't sit outside my house. Anyway, there is a lot of gremlins here this morning. I'm just trying to do a live show, people. Um, Clive, what are you saying down there? You're saying that uh, I would rather wait for Martinez to be fully fit for Liverpool, maybe get some minutes for Chelsea. Mm, I don't know. I'm going to read down some of your comments down here. Uh, Femi, you're feeling confident this morning. I think we'll win both matches against Chelsea and Liverpool. <laughs> yeah, you can all hear the motorbikes. <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> it's pretty good, this mic. It's directional. It doesn't normally pick up noise, but that is loud AF. <laughs> um, probably difficult to know when to bring players back, given the medical track record. Uh, we don't know, man. man. That's one thing I absolutely want. I want Gary O'Driscoll just to basically sack the whole medical staff team. Speaking of medical staff team, right? I saw this story over the weekend about... Malaysia. And you, I've waited, what, 20, 25 minutes into the show here. Um, not mentioned it yet. And I don't really think this is worthy of a full conversation because this has just come from, I don't even know who this bloke is. I think it's, I think he's like a German reporter. And he was saying that Malaysia is struggling not only physically, but also mentally. Now, this has not been reported from, from by uh, David Ornstein, by The Telegraph, by The Athletic, by The Times, by the BBC, by the... Anyway, it's just come out of here. And it just feels like a... It just feels a bit odd, if I'm honest. Like... Of course he is struggling mentally. The dude has missed an entire season of football, has had surgery, and then had to have more surgery because there was a setback from said surgery and even after both of those surgeries he's about to come back and then he gets another setback and he's probably going to miss the entire season anybody anybody even even the strongest the most resilient of players would struggle mentally with that so it kind of feels like um rather than any inside scoop or knowledge it's just kind of like I mean, yeah, of course, he's struggling mentally. And he absolutely will be. Um, I uh, I did a video on sort of last week on sort of what's happened to Malasia. And I kind of pieced it all together. And it is very strange. I have no idea who Luke Sean is either. <laughs> Luke Sean of the dead. 
Shaun of the Dead, great film. If you haven't watched Shaun of the Dead, go and watch it. And it's just, Man United are going to sign a left back in the summer. Guaranteed. At the start, of this, maybe even halfway, maybe not halfway through the season, but at one point this season, I think we all probably would have universally agreed that Man United, if we're going to sign a new fullback, we need to sign a new right back. Because we had Luke Shaw, the low and developed, but six a lot can change in six months. A lot can. And I think we're all pretty confident now about Diogo Delo as our right back in the idea that we're not going to go and spend, I don't know, we're not, we're not going to go and sign a top level right back now. If we signed one, it would probably mean that Wan Bissaka would have to leave and we'd sign, I don't know. I, I think I've got it completely wrong on Diogo Delo. I'm not, I don't have a good track record on fullbacks, I'll be honest. Malasia, we can't now rely on him next season. We can't, at this moment in time, we can't rely on Luke Shaw. So I don't think that will really truly ever change with Luke Shaw, if I'm being honest. It's just that he's, I think this season it's been his hamstrings, isn't it? Um, I think we'll sign, I've already done a video on sort of running through some options for every position. Okay. Uh, and I think we're going to sign a left back under the age of 23 who will be able to challenge Luke Shaw for that. I suppose, in a, in, in a sense, kind of what Tyrell Malasia was supposed to be. And I think, he, I, I thought in his first season, I thought Malasia was a pretty good, um, I thought it was a pretty good option at left back. I liked it when he came in. Did he make his full debut against Liverpool? I think he might have done. I can't remember. But injuries have just plagued him. And we don't know whether... Madison is going to ever be able to come back and be the be that same player. So left back is going to, is going to be a player we absolutely sign in the summer. Um, and as for Malasia having struggling mentally, it feels uh, it feels more like a, just a bit of an opinion here rather than anything sort of factual, like he's spoken to somebody in Malasia's camp or, or spoken to somebody close to him who said that. I don't think that was the case. That's that, that's just my interpretation of it. Um, I might be wrong there. Um, let me see what you're saying down here in the comments. The United Medical team failed Malasia. They haven't just failed Malasia, man. Like, Malasia and Martinez are two big, big ones, all right? Both of them had setbacks after surgery when they came back too soon or they were, they were working too hard too soon. So it's like... You, when you go through your rehab, like, look, I've got my, I've got my leg in a cast still. Um, that's coming off on Thursday. So that's six weeks. Anybody ever not walked on your leg for six weeks? Uh, takes ages. But anyway, we're getting there. That'll come off on Thursday and my rehab will start. I'll go into a boot. I won't be able to walk on my foot. If I try and walk on my foot straight away, I'll just collapse because my foot's going to look like a stick anyway. All the muscle will be wasted away. So I'm going to have to build up my my ankle strength again and it's going to take me a long time right i've done this surgery on my right foot before i know how long it takes it's going to take me a, like a solid it's about a year it's about a year's worth of rehab because it's a complete foot and ankle reconstruction everything that was before is different so i know how long it takes i know uh, these are professional footballers are completely different right but the rehab has to be right is the point i'm saying and the medical team, with Malasia, with Martinez, and pretty much all season long, have just consistently been getting it wrong. They've been, I don't know whether it's they're, they're pushing players slightly too hard too soon, which aggravates a problem, whether they're doing the wrong, I mean, this is what, this is what rehab is. Rehab is about training your body and, and, and healing a problem. That's what rehab is. So, we don't know whether Malasia, as far as I know, it was a knee problem with Malasia, which is a bit, which is kind of a bad one, really, because it, all the power going through your knee, that's why ACL injuries are so bad, um, and can change how a player plays football. Sometimes you can't put this same amount of power back through your knee than what you were doing before. I've got no idea. And I'm, I'm more worried, if I'm being honest... I'm more worried about Martinez's 
recovery from this injury than I was for both injuries before because both of those were metatarsal impact injuries. It's kind of like a broken bone. Far easier to fix a broken bone than it is to fix soft tissue, tendons, muscles, because they work differently, right? And Martinez, now that, it could have been a lot worse had Kufal not stopped his whole body weight going on his knee, but his knee went in a direction where he's not supposed to go. So I'm probably a little bit more worried about Martinez coming back from this one, but truth be told, we don't know whether Malasia's ever going to be able to come back. Fingers crossed for his own sake, but yeah, the medical team really have let Malasia down. They've let um, Martinez down. They've let, well, they've let a lot of United players down this season. And on the, at the same time as that, I think that Eric Ten Hag's intense training methods have been a contributing factor. You remember after the, what game was it? Was it, was it McTominay against Chelsea? I think after it, and he said, oh, we had really light training this week and it's allowed, it, it left us kind of feeling refreshed. Because the training methods for Eric Ten Hag were needed at the start, right? Because everybody was ill. They had no discipline in the squad whatsoever. But, hmm. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Let's move on to the next talking point. I digress. Uh, Jordan's saying, do try 18 months not be able to walk on. Ooh, that's a long time. That is a long time. Six weeks is long enough in crutches, I'll tell you that. I hate hobbling on one foot. Really annoying. Can't do much. Um, Old Trafford, all right? Going to pull up this little snippet from an article from Mike Keegan on the development of Old Trafford. I have done plenty. I, I, I've done lots of content around Old Trafford. Last week, I did a kind of a different video, which I quite enjoyed. Some of you, I'm so, sure some of you didn't, not everybody. I did it on a Bondi bot. Is, he's like a 3D animator. I don't know the right way to describe him. But he has created 3D visualizations of what would happen if the south stand was increased and we build over the railway line. He's done what would happen if there was a complete redesign and a restructure of everything on the outside of Old Trafford. What could that look like? What happens if you do both together, A and B? You extend over the south stand and you build a new exterior to Old Trafford. And then D, what about a new stadium? And I ran through the video that kind of reacted to it. Now, I think the overwhelming majority of us, uh, off key, it's not AI, it's just it's him using like uh, CAD programs, like computer aid design, like building it out from there. It's pretty damn awesome. Uh, I, if, I'll go, go and watch it on the channel. You'd enjoy it. I think the overwhelming majority of us, I don't know what it would be as a percentage, and I can't do a poll here. The overwhelming majority of us would love the concept of staying at Old Trafford. Of Old Trafford being 90... Well, I want it to be 100k plus. Right, This is what... If we're if we're going through the the ag of a new stadium, whether that would be uh, redeveloped Old Trafford or whether that would be a new stadium, and it's going to be ag, all right? There's going to be yeah, there will just be ag. I want it to be hundred k plus. Now, Populous are the architects who were brought in by the Glazers a while ago. Okay. And they were brought in by the Glazers a while ago to, to sort of like to start investigating options and plans. That's now gone a level further because uh, the Old Trafford Task Force has been created by Jim Ratcliffe. That's got Andy Burnham, Mayor of Manchester. That's got Gary Neville. That's got, uh, I don't know, someone from Trafford Council on there as well. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a board and they're all together going to be looking at the feasibility of a redeveloped Old Trafford or a new stadium. So come, I reckon around about October time-ish, somewhere around about October, we're going to know what's going on. Is it going to be a new stadium? Is it going to be a redeveloped Old Trafford? We'll get an answer then because they'll have all the feasibility studies. They'll look at it socially, economically, space-wise, timeline-wise, how much you'd need, 
loads and loads and loads. Now, populace how, are involved from an architectural perspective. And populace have just been given, well, they've just won this. They've won the um, contract to design the new stadium that's going to be built in Casablanca in Morocco for, I believe, is it 2030 World Cup? There it is. Yeah, there you go. 2030 World Cup. Have they already won that? Yeah, they got named as joint hosts alongside Spain and Portugal. So they're building a massive stadium in Casablanca, 115,000. It would be the biggest stadium in world football. So Mike King got excited and said, oh, look, Populous, because look, they're going to be building a stadium now. There's 115,000 over there in Morocco. Well, that means that they're going to build a massive stadium at Old Trafford. No, it just goes to show that they're going to be involved in projects of that size. We all know, right? Jim Ratcliffe hasn't exactly hidden what he wants. He wants a new stadium. It is abundantly obvious that Jim Ratcliffe feels a brand new stadium is what he wants. But 115,000? Man, that is a big ass stadium they're building out in, in, um, in Casablanca. <laughs> That's huge. I don't really think, in fact, there's a video I want to do, and I'm going to be doing it at some point. I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive into, let's say, five. I'm going to choose like five stadiums in world football that we can look at. Uh, so, whether, so, for example, the new Bernabeu. We'll take a look at that. We'll take a look at the, at the redevelopment and the refurbishment of the new camp as well. We'll look at the projects. We'll look at the prices. We'll look at the timelines. We'll look at who's doing it, what's being done, where those clubs were going. Well, we're going to play during that time and see what we can learn about kind of what everyone else has been doing or have done about a new stadium because I think that will be a nice little informative video to do. But I think at this point now, there's not really too much more that we can say around the stadium that we haven't already said. I would be amazed if you could get Old Trafford to 100,000. Adding 25,000 into that stadium is what? I don't know. I wonder how much you'd actually get. I don't, know what, I don't know what the capacity difference is between the north and the south. It must be like 10 grand. Actually, I don't know what, I don't know what the individual capacities are of the, of the, four sta the four stands at Old Trafford. But I imagine you probably get another 10,000. You probably get a little bit more as well, increasing the quadrants over there and over there. Because that's what the new... The south stand wouldn't just be this part here. Let's see if I can get this. Have I got this? Can I turn that on? No. Hmm. Mate, the Allegiant in Vegas. Man, that stadium is Beautiful. The screens they got at the top of that stadium are nuts. Oh, nuts. Anyway, I think I've kind of done as much as I need to do on the new stadium. But Populous, who are going to be involved with Manchester United's new stadium, they've won the contract to build a 115,000-seater in Casablanca for the 2030 World Cup. So they're going to have experience of managing projects of that size. I suppose that's what we learned from that. We'll see. Mate, Darren, I've been to New Camp twice. Twice? I've been twice on once. I think I've been twice. I'm pretty sure I've been twice. Anyway. It's so long up there. It's so far. It's like watching Subutio. And the experience of getting in and out of that stadium is so long. There's so many stairs to walk up. It's way out of town. You can never get cabs back. You have to. It's just when when you when you look at the Camp Nou as a fan, like oh, I love that. It'd be incredible to go and watch United play at the Camp Nou. Hey, truth be told, and the experience of it in real life is nowhere near as good as you think it is in your head. Barcelona is a city, though. Mm. I love that place, Barcelona and Amsterdam. That's where I want to live. One of those two places. Anyway, um, 
yeah, <laughs> legitimately so much better on TV <laughs> than it is in real life. <laughs> You're just like, who's got a ball? I, got no, I can't see. You can't see because you've got big old netting and huge plastic screens in front of you as well. Anyway, let's speak about this man, okay? Eric Ten Hag. And this is going to be the final little talking point for today's show. I'm going to do this, I believe, as my lunchtime video today because I think this is really, really important, all right? And it's based around this article here. The premise is quite simple, okay? You can see it there. Ratcliffe wants a football-focused head coach with diversified responsibilities of a manager taken on by the CEO and sporting director. And there's been so much conversation about, and this, this is why I want to do this as a lunchtime video today, and I'll be interested to know your points of view. There's been so much talk about whether United should keep Eric Ten Hag, whether Jim Ratcliffe will want to keep Eric Ten Hag, whether Ineos want Ten Hag. And there's, there's so much conversation all about that, which I think is all fair discourse. I think it's, it's it, where we, we should be having these conversations. But I don't particularly think there's been much conversation about, well, what if Eric Ten Hag doesn't want to do it? And I, I, just, I just don't think this is I just don't think this is a conversation that really um, too many United fans have been having so far. Because remember that when I, I'll pull up all the quotes, I'll do my research, I'll, I'll make sure I find exactly what he said. But when Eric Ten Hag took the job at Manchester United, he took the job on the premise that he had that power. He, let, I'm pretty sure he literally said, "I wouldn't have taken the job unless I had this power." So that might, I mean, that could be a sticking point. And I, I, I just think it's kind of interesting that it's being kind of blown over or brushed over, not blown over. Because I don't know whether he will be. I'm not, I'm not saying he won't be, right? But it's that he would, Eric Ten Hag, to exist in this newer version of Manchester United, will have to accept a kind of a significantly lesser role from a power perspective. He'd still be the manager, right? He'd still be in control, but he would have to accept a lot less power, a lot less power with transfers, a lot less power outside of the training ground. And I, 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 I think it's worthy of um, a lunchtime video discussion. Um, did, did it, did it. And yeah, again, this, this is all going to be mentioned in the video. I think the best of Eric Ten Hag was when he was in this role at Ajax. Was when he had Overmars, was when he had Van der Sar, and he had the structure behind the scenes, a structure that he trusted, and maybe that's part of it. I mean, how could he possibly trust Bradder and Ashworth coming? I've never worked with you before. I don't know who you are. But he'd have to trust Jim Ratcliffe, I suppose, where the big trust goes. Are you really going to be putting this structure in place to help me? Because ultimately, that's, that's what all of this is geared towards. All these changes, everything is geared towards making the manager's job possible. Because then the football team wins. And that's the ultimate ambition. Whereas before at Manchester United, it's been the opposite. It's never really been about helping the manager at all. It's been about the bottom line on the numbers. It's been about making more money. It's not been about the football. And this is, this is a really, I think, a very important discussion point that we need to have at lunchtime today about whether or not you feel that Ten Hag is himself going to be happy accepting a lesser role. Because, of course, remember what happened with Ralph Ragnick at the start. Lots of us felt that Ralph was really hard done by. That can't, I think the club massively shafted him. I don't even know if they really, truly ever created or designed the consultancy role. I think they just sold that to him at the start. Because I don't think it was even fully formed until a month or two before the end of the season. Or a month or two before Eric Ten Hag came in. I'm going to read some of your comments out down here. Um, how soon does that conversation with Ten Hag need to happen? 
Uh, this conversation should have already happened. This is this is something that um, Ineos would have been planning for a long, long time. And I would be surprised, if I'm honest, maybe not in the initial conversations with Ratcliffe and, and Ten Hag, but pretty early on. I would be amazed if this conversation hadn't already happened. I would be amazed if, if Ineos and Ratcliffe didn't know either way. Personally, I would be, I wouldn't be amazed. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't even be that shocked if Eric Ten Hag said, you know what? No, I don't want to work in that environment. But at the same time, I look, I look at it and go, that's how you work to Ajax, man. It's definitely going to be an interesting lunchtime video and, uh, and a conversation I think is worthy of having a discussion about when I don't think really anybody's thinking about Ten Hag's future right now from that perspective. And I think that's kind of brushing over a really important point. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes pride can kill you. Sometimes. Like last couple of minutes of the show, um, you fire in your questions at me. I apologize. <laughs> can I just say it one more time as well? That was one of the most <laughs> awful starts to the show I've ever had. <laughs> but then Nuruddin gifting 150 memberships, man. Now, do you know how ridiculously generous that is? There's 150 of you. I can't I apologize. I can't even leave a bloody comment on here. Actually, let me just open it up on here and I'll be able to leave a comment. There we go. I've got no idea what's going on here, why that's there. But everybody, that's the link to the Discord. All right. Please come and join in. We've got the live show started. That worked on Friday. A few of you joined in. That was brilliant. Um, I promise I'm working towards the Q&As. I promise I'm working towards the members only videos. Once this merch is launched, so the merch, fingers crossed, all right. Was it two? No way, was it 200? Oh my God. I don't know how many. Oh my God. I can't even see on here. But I'm hoping that the merch will be launched in the next couple of weeks. And this has been something that I've worked on since I think about September. I had it ready to go in November, but it just, it, you know what was going on with United in November. There was no way that I was going to be launching, um, no way that I was going to be launching merch into that environment. It just wasn't right. So I've waited and waited and waited. I've got more designs done. It's wicked, man. It's wicked. Seven Samurai, how you doing, man? Haven't seen you in a while. Nice. Uh, let me see what you're saying question-wise. You don't forget to mention the agency, Ten Hag, some managers in the lunchtime. You're talking about, like, is it Seg? Seg? I think it is. I think it is. These transfer changes will affect their agency. Yeah, well, I can mention that. There's a little bit of... um. Conspiracy theory. I have no idea how many memberships were gifted, man, down here. I can't actually see. Everybody in the everybody in the comments is saying something completely different. I just love this community. I really, really do. And I hope I'm doing you proud with the growth. Um I'm working really, really hard. I, I've I told you about this, right? For the transfer window. You remember the whiteboard that was here? The whiteboard won't be coming back but we're going to have brand new digital versions of the whiteboard. It's going to be another level up, just like we've leveled up here with the software and eventually the Facebook chat will work again. Um, it's going to be good, man. It's going to be good. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, who else would be better than Ten Hag, says Nas. I mean, look, there's, let's not lie. There are some seriously impressive managers that would be available on the market this summer. Whether that's Alonso, whether that's De Zerbi, whether that's Nagelsmann, whether that's you want to go... I don't know, different than that. You could go Ruben Amarim. You could go Thiago Motta. There are lots of managers at different various points in their careers who have done it in different leagues, who all have their own sort of styles, whether you're Motta and you're playing with two wing backs and the same with Alonso at Leverkusen. And it's just, let's not pretend that there's not some uh, exciting managers available. 
But then I look at Eric Ten Hag and I remember what he was when he came in. And he was one of those up-and-coming, exciting managers. And he just never had the right environment. And last season, despite all of that, we won the League Cup. We got to the FA Cup final. We got a top four finish this season. It has kind of gone to pot. And I think the thing that surprised most of us this season, if I was to nail it down to one thing that's made people question Ten Hag the most... I think it's been the fact that Ten Hag has seemingly sort of walked away from the principles that we all thought he had uh, from a footballing perspective and just went mega pragmatic. And I think that's probably the biggest point of concern that a lot of us have had. My, my, my point of concern as well. I, I interpreted Eric Ten Hag's philosophy wrong. I didn't realise how player-focused it was and how he adapts it to the players he's got available. And that's something that I'm learning about Ten Hag. I'm sure we all are too. But that lunchtime video, it's going to be an important one, I think. I'm going to see, I'll read out a couple of your questions out there. Uh, did, 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 did. Uh, uh, digital whiteboard indeed, Carl. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, did, 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 did. Surely Ten Hag will relinquish some power to be the manager that gets us back to the top. I mean, I think he should. I think he would. But let's be honest. I don't know. Vicky, is it Sancho's birthday? Is it? Happy birthday, Sancho. How old is he now? What is he, like 24? Man, Sancho has been around for so long. It feels like he should be a bloody 30-year-old. 24. Damn. I got it right. Happy birthday, Sancho. Uh, still looking for someone to help. Yeah, Alex, the podcast is... The podcast has just gone on the back burner. I really need a proper solid co-host to be able to relaunch that properly. Uh, I haven't really looked. I've just been too busy with the story, narrative videos with hiring editors for those, with launching the merch. There's just a few, a few things going on, but I want to. I want to get that. Um, I want to get that podcast relaunched. I miss doing it with the boys, uh, the guys that I've met through football, and I don't get to go to many games anymore because I'm working too much. Um, so that's why I love the podcast. But anyway, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to Nur Dean. Thank you to everybody for making this community what it is. A couple of days off, and we're straight back in. Football this week, Saturday night, 8 p.m. That's a pretty horrendous kickoff time. I'll be completely honest. Um, lots of build up that will be going the whole week. My lunchtime video is going to be on Eric Ten Hag and a conversation I think we need to have around his future from the Ten Hag perspective rather than anybody else. Thank you all for tuning in. I'll hopefully get the Facebook chat working for tomorrow. We'll see. Take it easy.